You're listening to How to Stan, the podcast all about both specific fandoms and fandom culture as a whole. For more information about the show and the other show that I do, 17 Karat K-Pop, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. You can also go to 17karatkpop.weebly.com backslash how to stand for more specific information about this podcast. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to How to Stand. Today, we're going to talk about 10 iconic brands and what made them iconic, and how these brands, these products, developed such loyal followings, and the unique stories behind different fans that have fandoms that have formed for these products and what the big deal is, how those fandoms were created, how these physical material items came to mean so much more to certain people. Number one, Surge. It started out as this Facebook page back in 2011 created by this guy named Evan Carr in California. Surge was founded by Vault, actually, and Vault had just been discontinued so it felt like the right time for Evan Carr to remind everyone how superior Surge was compared to Vault, and so the Facebook page was born. It soon became a popular page for three different admins to switch off roles, just posting to this Facebook page all about their love for the drink Surge. This Surge fandom that basically developed through this Facebook page was super open. These three administers of the account would serve kind of as PR people for the brand, as customer service reps answering questions about Surge and why the appeal was there. They were also content moderators, so when fans would post things that were negative to the Facebook page, the administers would shut those questions down and post responses like, everyone, please be kind, get that out of here, things like that, trying to just keep the positive vibe going and keep the focus on why they were there in the first place, which is to appreciate Surge and not troll each other. The Facebook page also served as a special organizing place for action that these fans could take. These surging days or surge days were scheduled once a month so that that day of every month the fans would just bombard the Coke customer service line with surge requests asking Coke to help bring back surge. The campaign then went further by creating this Billboard Indiegogo funding project. The project raised over $3,700 by January of 2014, and then by February of 2014, the billboard was already up outside of Coke's headquarters in Atlanta. This billboard that was crowdfunded read, Dear Coke, we couldn't buy Surge, so we bought this billboard instead. That billboard went up in February, and by September of that year, Surge was back in stock, Fans rejoiced on that Facebook page, posting pictures of their loads they stocked up the minute that Surge went back on sale and then it quickly sold out. That relaunch then led to super fans basically hoarding the Surge. As for Evan Carr, he was thanked for his role in getting Surge to come back by being invited to join the other administrators of the Facebook account to attend a relaunch party at Coca-Cola's headquarters, and they also got insider information confirming the news that Surge was back before anyone else did. Number two is Coca-Cola, the company itself. In March 2013, Coca-Cola sent vending machines around the world with the Coca-Cola logo on them naturally called Small World Machines, which pretty much embodied the whole company motto that year as they tried to rebrand. They tried to rebrand as so much more than just a drink, but as these small little world, and that's what the commercials took after as well. This whole little paradise, this cutesy animated world that people could escape into if they just drank Coke. They tried to keep the wholesome vibes up by having this Refresh the Feed campaign in 2018, and over 69 million social media impressions were seen of this hashtag Refresh the Feed Uh, amount of posts. Over 1.4 million engagements occurred just within one day of this event happening, so needless to say, online it was a huge success. And on World Kindness Day, they officially made the rebrand official with this campaign. The Coca-Cola site traffic ended up rising 600% as a result of this campaign, promoting acts of kindness and posting them to social media with the right hashtag. In 2019, there was another addition to this campaign where Coca-Cola encouraged its social media followers to tweet hashtag kindness starts with and then fill in the blank there. The appeal of this brand was further 
solidified through studies like the case study looking at a Coca-Cola museum in Atlanta, Georgia. This is a study, a case study that I will post the link to on my site. It's called Retail Spectacles and Brand Meaning, Insights from a Brand Museum Case Study from the Journal of Retailing. These sociologists notice key distinctions between brand museums and your traditional ones. These brand muse museums are situated in the present and traditional museums are all about the past and preserving relics of a previous time in history. But brand museums are more like a walking commercial, a place you can walk through advertisements that are relevant today and feel more relevant today. They also viewed brand museums as having meaning across seven different dimensions sociologically. Humanization, socialization, localization, globalization, contextualization, theatricalization, and characterization. These seven dimensions are ways that bring a brand to life and help give it an identity that fans want to latch onto and continue to support. Number three, Starbucks, which also has a similar identity that goes beyond the actual items. Starbucks actually won the Silver IPA Effectiveness Award back in 2018, and Starbucks in the UK spent seven years working on this marketing strategy, shifting the focus from more traditional to more online media promotions, resulting in 18 million Instagram followers and a lot of other social media fame. Starbucks has continued to have viral content through celebrity endorsements and through just super Instagram-worthy, blogger-worthy products that are more about aesthetics than taste, possibly, like the unicorn frappuccino craze and other limited edition, very photogenic drink options that are keeping people talking for sure. Number four, Red Bull. Red Bull, as an account, I kid you not, has over 9 million YouTube subscribers. Red Bull has furthered its social media presence with all sorts of action-packed videos that match the high energy you're supposed to associate with Red Bull. Red Bull posted this space jump video featuring a professional daredevil, Felix Baumgartner, which got over 2.6 million social media mentions. They also like to mix longer and more short-form content on social media that they post to appeal to every viewer's taste and what kind of action-packed videos they enjoy watching. Number five, Chipotle. This Mexican restaurant is one of the first who actually started experimenting with TikTok videos, which are now all the rage. They started the challenge, the Chipotle Lid Flip, which reached over 240 million views. They tried the TikTok challenge Guac Dance, which reached 430 million views in less than one week. And the increased time spent focused on their social media marketing correlated to a rise in profits for quarter three of 2019. The digital sales during just one quarter of 2019 grew 88% for Chipotle, thanks to using these viral hashtags and having goofy TikTok challenges like the lid flip. Number six, Nutella. There was a Nutella superfan named Sarah Rosso in 2007 who made big headlines. She is an American who lived in Italy, and she was wondering why Nutella wasn't popular in America, but it was all the rage in Italy, and she thought it would suit American tastes. So she started a blog to promote World Nutella Day, a day that she created, a holiday, and she also created this go-to site for food bloggers and fellow Nutella fans alike. She really helped expand the awareness of this brand, of this chocolatey spread, by creating this blog behind it and just expanding its social media presence and causing Google searches for it to skyrocket worldwide. She also published the unofficial guide to Nutella with Michelle Fabio in 2012, but apparently the brand did not appreciate her efforts as much as she had hoped. She was quite shocked to get a cease and desist letter from Ferrero, the company behind Nutella, because she wasn't trying to make money off of her love for this. She just wanted to spread the word genuinely. She had a full-time job at the time, too, separate from this Nutella hobby of hers. She wasn't promoting them to try to get a job with them or anything like that. But she was sent a cease and desist letter anyway for what they, they accused her of profiting off of the brand. Ferrero did retract the cease and desist letter eventually after lots of positive press coverage happened for the brand due to World Nutella Day. So in the end, her efforts 
bore fruit, and mainstream American media then wildly covered this holiday and brought lots of publicity to the company worldwide. A few years after this debacle, Russo gladly gave the rights to World Nutella Day to Ferrero so that they could basically officially coin the holiday for her, but her only request was that if they did this, she just wanted to be compensated in terms of a donation to the World Food Program instead of a direct amount of money going right to her. This is a great lesson, I think, for other brands about how to keep your relationship with customers amicable. And maybe a cease and desist letter isn't the best option. And maybe stop and think about what they're doing and how it could actually help your bottom line. And don't resort to the legal action just yet because it's unnecessary. Number seven. All sorts of sneaker brands and athletic gear do a great job promoting themselves online and just in life, but I'm going to focus on Nike, which has over 90 million Instagram followers, being one of the most popular clothing brands to follow on Instagram for sure. They have, of course, going for them the easy, memorable slogan, just do it. They have a lot of celebrity endorsements, obviously. But they also have a lot of social media-ready campaigns. For example, they have the Play the World campaign, which encouraged social distancing and indoor play. The Play for the World campaign was launched in the spring of 2020 when everyone had to socially distance due to the pandemic. They also tried to meet the cultural moment with the You Can't Stop Us campaign, featuring images and videos of big-time stars and smaller stars finding ways to work out at home. The makers of the game campaign was a Kobe Bryant tribute. They've just continuously tried to have these online campaigns that match up with what is being talked about in the news that day. They also provide some weekly live stream YouTube workout classes, and there is a Nike training club app that you can use. They also pledged $17 million to COVID-related causes, saying, quote, These grants will support on-the-ground organizations that need it the most, such as health, social services, and humanitarian organizations, food banks, and COVID-19 response funds. They also took LEGO's approach in terms of repurposing their materials in their factories to make PPE, which pays dividends for them to do in the long run because it leads to a lot of positive press coverage. Lego started making face shields instead of toys with their material, and similar PPE was made through Nike athletic gear. Number eight, Dove. Dove became most well known for its Real Beauty campaign, which is basically all about promoting this unfiltered, unretouched photo campaign about body positivity. There's a lot to unpack there regarding actually how much body positivity it truly shows and how much further it could go, but I digress. They still got so much publicity from that and are still well known for it. They also partnered with Getty Images and Girl Gaze for this campaign in 2019 called Show Us. In the Show Us campaign was, quote, a groundbreaking library of over 5,000 photographs devoted to shattering beauty stereotypes by showing female identifying and non-binary individuals as they are, not as others believe they should be. Brands were welcome to use the pics in this database they built in 2019 just because they wanted to increase the representation of all female identifying and non-binary individuals in the beauty world. So then brands could use these images freely to help diversify who they were showing in their advertising. Advertisements. Truly, truly, truly the ultimate reaping the benefits of user-generated content and what that could look like. Number nine, Ikea. An Ikea superfan named Jules Yap ran this site called ikeahacker.net where she would give people these Ikea hacks, as she called them, for how to make and move around and reorganize your Ikea furniture in your house. In 2014, Ikea sent her a cease and desist letter for this because... She was kept promoting the brand name, and she was using a URL that was affiliated with Ikea. They were worried that they would be associated with IkeaHacker.net, and they didn't want that. But they didn't issue the cease and desist for a full decade. In 2014, they issued it, but the site had been up for a decade already, which is interesting. Yep, got a pretty good lawyer, though, who helped reach an agreement with Ikea. So the site was allowed to stay up for non-commercial purposes only. That was the agreement they made, so she couldn't run any ads through the site or anything else that would allow her to profit off of this how-to blog using IKEA furniture. This sci-fi author, liberal copyright law advocate, and co-editor of this blog called Boing Boing 
named Cory Doctorow said this decision was ultimately censorship and unfair, and he accused IKEA of being ungrateful for having to enter a legal issue in the first place, and they should have just let this fan continue to give them free publicity. Following all the IKEA fan backlash to IKEA's response, that led to them to change their stance, and eventually IKEA ended up on better terms with Yep by allowing her to run ads again on her site, and Yep got to visit the company's home offices for free. Number 10, Polaroid. There was a crisis among Polaroid fans in February of 2018 when Polaroid announced it was no longer going to sell instant film for their Polaroid cameras. Fans created this massive grassroots campaign to get Polaroids to restock instant film. They started sending Polaroids to the headquarters in protest. They sent letters to the rival company Fujifilm, begging them to start making instant film to show it to Polaroid, the company. They sent in petition signatures. There was one online petition that gathered 30,513 signatures. And they started a mega project. It was a team of fans and investors who worked on what they called the Impossible Project. And the ultimate goal was to bring instant film back into stores. So they made their own formula of instant film. They physically tried to create their own recipe for instant film. Polaroid did still end up going broke and bankrupt at the end of 2018, but the brand still lives on. You've still heard of Polaroids, I'm sure, and the trademark still stands. So other companies who want to use the Polaroid name and logo still have to pay for it. So Polaroid literally does live on as a brand in the legal world, but it also lives on just in people's minds because they invested so much into this. As for these superfans, unclear how successful they were at making their own formula for instant film. Probably not the quality of the actual Polaroid film, but maybe it works quite well for them. But it really goes to show what fandoms can become surrounding brands, that they can really put their heads together and create really incredible things and really show their love for a product in new and ingenious ways. So what is the big deal and what are all these companies doing? Why are they putting so much effort into creating this unique brand identity? I think a key way to understand this better is looking at a quote from the author of Super Fandom, Zoe Fraud Blinar. There's a full episode of the show featuring my longer interview with her that gets into this as well. But a key quote from that book that I want to share is, The purpose of fandom is to project a personal meaning into what would otherwise be a soulless commercial commodity. That's ultimately what fandoms are all about. It's all about a brand, whether you want to call it a brand or not, whether you're buying into the concept of a musician's work or a movie plot or something else you're literally or just symbolically buying into, you're becoming a fan because you want to project a personal meaning into what you're watching. Because the content is just what it is. What adds meaning to it is you and your experience with it and what you say and do related to that brand. That's ultimately what these brands are. And in that interview, Zoe Frablinar distinguished between a fan and just a consumer. If you just buy Starbucks, for example, you're just, even if you buy it every single day, you're not necessarily a Starbucks fan. You cross over into fan territory when you do something beyond drink Starbucks, when you do something beyond the original intent of the brand's product. So for Starbucks, if you start a blog about Starbucks, if you start bedazzling Starbucks cups to sell, I don't know, whatever you're doing with the Starbucks brand that is beyond just drinking it and buying it for people, that is, then you've entered Starbucks fan status. That is just the ultimate example of how you inject a personal flair into your experience with a product. And that's what these companies collectively have done so successfully, is they have found ways to engage consumers in a way that allows them to keep pushing that personal meaning into the product so they're more likely to stay loyal to the product because they've tried these viral challenges with the product or they have exchanged ideas and tips for how to use the product through blogs. They've found ways to make it their own and personalize their experience with it and ironically that leads to a more collective experience with the product as well and they find a community of like-minded super fans online to talk to about this beloved product and it becomes to mean so much more than just a product. Coke becomes so much more than just Coke if you are immersed in this 
little tiny world as they call it and you watch the commercials and you rant about them with your friends on social media. Red Bull becomes so much more than just Red Bull if you are part of the 9 million YouTube subscribers commenting on their viral videos. Another key quote from Super Fandom, quote, Although brand meanings might be ascribed and communicated to consumers by marketers, consumers in turn uncover and activate their own brand meanings, which are communicated back to marketers and the associated brand community, unquote. It's basically a feedback loop, and it's constantly influenced. The campaigns are influenced by what fans want, and the fans are influenced by the brand, and they continue to be cyclical in that way. One more interesting study worth noting for now is from the Journal of Consumer Research, and it's called Consumer Culture Theory, 20 Years of Research. Consumer culture theory is basically a way to study consumer culture, naturally. It's kind of an umbrella term. It's used to describe the dynamics between and among marketplaces and cultural meanings and consumer behavior and how all of that influences each other. In this study said, quote, the marketplace provides consumers with an expansive and heterogeneous palette of resources from which to construct individual and collective identities. This theory basically helps better understand consumer habits by fo focusing on different subject areas like marketplace culture as well as social context, the mass-mediated ideologies of the time. It lays out all these main broad categories you can group their conclusions into, but all to say that consumers are always in the middle of striving to personalize their experience with the brand while collectively enjoy the brand. It's all about the individual and collective experiences that are created constantly and simultaneously. Consumerism they also view as a way of not just buying something, but buying into some new, something new, some new life, some new way of being, that you that it is a way to inject something new into your life because it adds a new personality trait to you or a new hobby or something like that. Markets provide these material goods that further solidify and manifest a certain personality trait you want, maybe. For example, buying a Red Bull can further symbolize to you you're a high energy person. It can be what you want to put into the world. And the ultimate phrase that jumped out at me from the study is this pool of symbolic resources. And that's ultimately what any shopper is doing. They're looking at a pool of potential symbols in their lives and using whichever ones, buying whichever ones they see fit for their own personal needs. But what is available in that pool of resources to them is further altered by all sorts of issues like price and availability and things like that. So it's very interesting how collective, the collective need or desire for something shapes how it's available. So the options offered to you are affected by the collective mentality, but ultimately everything you take from the pool of resources is your individual choice. So your choices start out limited because of the collective mindset, but they're still individual choices simultaneously. This is further looked into and the dark side of becoming a fan of something like a brand is something looked at in other studies that we're going to talk about on the show next week, where I'm going to talk further about 10 more interesting companies and really what has led them to have the dynamics they do, what has led to the push and pull between consumers and them that has kept the brands alive and relevant, and what that says about our culture. We will unpack all of that further next time, but this was just an intro into this topic. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next week.